After a long lunch of flirting over burritos, I lead her towards Mission Dolores, asking how she feels about Hitchcock's vertigo. Of course, you have to go through the whole chapel and museum thing before you can get to the cemetery. I give her my charming, or else tedious, jam-packed geographical history lesson outlining the colonization of New Spain, the Mexican independence of 1821, and the Mexican-American War, while we stand in front of the 1939 World's Fair diorama version of the original mission. We then move on for more leisurely flirting in the cemetery so I can show her the low-angle shot setup of Jimmy Stewart stalking Kim Novak. We make a quick dash through the gift shop and emerge back to the harsh sunlight of the real world. It's like coming out of a movie. Ask any Californian about the gold rush of 1849, and they can probably tell you several relevant facts about that formative moment in time. That same person's historical knowledge is much less likely to extend one year back to the state's far more significant historical moment of 1848, the year in which the Republic of Mexico ceded to the United States, the states of California, Nevada, and Utah, as well as parts of Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Wyoming, by signing the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, ending the Mexican-American War. That document also included the Mexican relinquishment of all claims to Texas. Historians of the Mexican-American War often emphasize the idea that Mexico was not successfully governing the territory or its people because the area was so far flung and sparsely populated. This evidence is cited to point towards the conclusion that the American takeover was inevitable and not so much an act of outright aggression as a foregone conclusion. While there's no doubt that ownership of the territory was a complicated matter, President Polk's offer to purchase the land from Mexico seems a strong indicator he recognized their legitimate claim to it. Spending time in Los Angeles, I cross paths with so many women, all mostly unavailable somehow, straight, married, crazy, what have you. I'm invigorated by the sense of possibility here. People believe good things will happen at any moment. Their openness to new opportunities reflects an unrealistically optimistic worldview, which is either infectious or geographically instilled like some Golden State version of Jerusalem Syndrome. I once went to a Tony Kushner lecture where, in the midst of singing the praises of dialectics and socialism, he eloquently railed against the bourgeois decadence of nostalgia. B. 
Being a painfully nostalgic person, I've felt guilty ever since. To this day, I suffer from a compulsion to defend my overly intense attachment to the past. I run about the country a few weeks each year making speeches. Since I'm a playwright, I'm expected to talk about the theater, the only subject about which I'm presumed qualified to speak. But I'm not qualified to speak about it, really. I've only been doing it for 13 years. Maybe when I'm 80, I'll be qualified. And no one wants to hear about the theater anyway. So tonight, I'm going to talk about socialism, about which I'm not qualified to speak. And no one wants to hear about socialism either. But at least you're no worse off than if I talked about theater. Everything new is better than everything old. The bad new things instead of the good old things, wrote that great dialectical play, playwright, poet, and theorist Bertolt Brecht. I love the rigor of that challenge, to be able to risk the satanic temptation and a retreat backwards towards what's easy, familiar, and safe, the remembered past which is always misremembered, to always be on guard against nostalgia, to be able to see the future in the bad new things. Aside from introducing the burden of Tony Kushner's disapproval into my life, this speech has also stuck with me for more than a decade now for being an utterly inspired and cathartic diatribe, illuminating the evils of capitalism while reclaiming the merits of socialism and managing to be wildly entertaining along the way. In the same way that outdoorsy people experience feelings of calm and wholeness from spending time in nature, there are also those of us who discover a profound serenity in the man-made environment of yesterday. All of this is not simple nostalgia, not Proust and the Madeleine, and not an escapist Luddite rejection of forward movement into the future but rather it is an attempt at mindfulness and a strategy in this exceptionally digital age for staying connected to the physical analog world in which we live. <laughs> 